I'm glad we're driving, we're taking a train back rather than going on this plane because I think that'll be less pressure. All right. Yeah. Hey, folks. Well, Announcement time. <laughs> Heidi would like feedback on what did you like about ShmooCon? What can we do better? Um, you can provide feedback basically by mugging anyone in a blue shirt or email to feedback at shmoocon.org. We'd like to thank the AV crew for recording all of the talks. Uh, if you missed a talk that you want, uh, they have a booth out there. You can buy a DVD uh, and I'll talk to them about the delivery arrangements. Um, swag time. Okay, everybody heads up. Oh, my eye! <laughs> So, uh, Sarah and Patrick are going to talk to us about cyber ITL, which I think means measuring software. All right. So, um, right. So the general question is, how risky is the software you use? Because uh, um, we are all there's a lot of talk about what things are safer or more risky, but a lot of the times there's a severe lack of data in the conversations happening in the security community. Uh, a lot of uh, the truthiness floating around where we make arguments that seem like they should maybe be true, but we don't have any data to back it up. You know, things like open source is safer because you can review code, but we don't know that people did review code or that they did a good job at it or this company's product is safer because I trust them and I have bought onto their brand or, you know, all that sort of thing. Uh, so the general goal is to uh, take some of the religious wars out of the security community and replace that with actual data-driven conversations. Um, uh, so uh, moving on, I am Sarah Zatko. I am the chief scientist at CITL. Uh, Pat here is one of the other members of our team in the restaurant in the second row there, uh, being supportive and all that jazz. <laughs> so, uh, CITL is a computer independent uh, cyber independent testing lab. Sorry, I'm a little sick today. Um, but we are a nonprofit based in the U.S. Nonprofit because we feel it's important to maintain our selves as an independent third party that doesn't have any access to grind or, you know, funding from people we're reviewing or things like that. Things that make similar sorts of efforts that other people try to compare us to a little bit questionable in terms of motivations. Um, and uh, the general mission is is founded by myself and Mudge, and the general mission is one that's modeled very closely off of that of consumer reports. So to improve the state of software security by providing the con software consuming public with accurate data that they can use to make better choices, empowering people to protect themselves. Um, and so we have funding from DARPA, from the Ford Foundation, and uh, um, from Stripe, uh, who's helping us pilot some of our efforts in a um, see how our data can be used in an enterprise environment. And then uh, consumer reports, which, you know, given that they were our goal for who we wanted to be, getting to work with them is pretty sweet. Um, and uh, with them, we've been working on the digital standard. I'm not going to talk about that here, but if you're interested in ways to approach evaluating digital security of products, it's an interesting to look at. It's broader reaching than ours, which is, you know, we're focusing on one specific angle of computer security because, you know, you have to pick something to do. You can't uh, evaluate. You can't be everything to everyone. Uh, so uh, that one brings in other groups that have other angles they're focusing on to try and get a broader view of digital security. Oh. So um, the general idea of what we want to do is product labeling. Uh, these are ones you'll be familiar with if you're from the U.S., uh, and they're all ones that are um, things we've been taking inspiration from. We want to do you know, software nutritional labeling to provide info about the contents of the software. You know, what libraries is it linking to? What functions are people calling? What safety features got put in there? All that jazz. But also things like the EPA mileage rating or Energy Star, where it's about, you know, how, what's the cost of ownership for this thing? Or, you know, how does it perform? Um, 
So some static and some dynamic analysis of software. Uh, in terms of look, we're more inspired by labeling coming out of the EU because it's just a lot more universally readable and just a lot less wordy and ugly than some of the US labels. So the, um, for given that our general goal is to influence consumers, uh, we want to make it as uh, friendly and understandable as possible because the one trend I've really noticed is that whenever I talk about this to somebody who isn't a computer security expert, the very first thing they say to me is, oh, I don't know anything about that, please stop talking. And so we want to make it as unscary as possible. <laughs> And uh, so uh, that's the, the dream for where we want to get to. Uh, how are we approaching this? So first, these are some early ugly-ish reports that we made for uh, our, mostly just for internal purposes to view application armoring and function hygiene features for uh, the applications we were reviewing. And even at this stage where somebody who didn't know exactly what we were doing wouldn't necessarily be able to interpret it. We could learn some interesting things about the processes that different organizations are using when it comes to security. Because when we looked at Microsoft Excel on OSX versus Google Chrome on OSX, we could see major trends in their different approaches to securing their products. Uh, in particular, uh, Google Chrome did really well on the application armoring side of things. They had even gone out of their way to enable uh, explicit heap data execution prevention flag that pretty much no one had enabled um, and had clearly gone to some effort to figure out how to do that. Um, whereas on not their home turf on OS X instead of Windows, Microsoft didn't do great on application armoring. They were missing some basic flags that most everyone else had. Um, and then on the other hand, Google Chrome was somewhat sloppy in terms of function hygiene. They had some of the good, safer, newer versions of things like, you know, stir all copies and things of that nature, but they had them side by side with all the older, riskier ones. So it was clear that there wasn't any organizational enforcement of good function hygiene and that it was just every developer for themselves and it's a bit of a, a crapshoot, the, you know, level of security knowledge of any given developer. Whereas uh, the complete absence of a lot of these bad functions in the Microsoft code showed that they had gotten beaten over the head for that stuff often enough that they were enforcing it at a larger organizational level. And uh, so it's fascinating the sorts of things you can learn about organizations. And in particular that these two different directions that these security teams took aren't mutually exclusive. There's no reason why an organization couldn't have good build systems that have all the latest and greatest and enforce good function hygiene earlier in their development process. It's just that um, when you just pick what seems most important to you, you can end up with blind spots you're not aware of, which is why this sort of evaluation before things go out the door is important to have in-house. Um, the, the stuff we're doing is not meant to replace the uh, evaluations that a vendor should be doing of their own products. It's meant to point out where they didn't do it. And then uh, the other way we've been presenting data is as histograms, because when you're viewing an entire operating system, you have thousands of binaries, so you end up with thousands of scores, and then you want to look at a general distribution, like what's the, the shape of that environment in terms of their scores. And we end up with two general sorts of things that we see uh, with operating system level views. If somebody actually went through and made an effort to be more uniform in how they did application armoring, then you end up with something like our hardened Gen 2 image where there's a big peak higher up on the scale and a lot less of a, you know, a tail going off into the lower scores because they, you know, were a little bit more organized about how they were doing their builds. Um, if you have just uh, something off the shelf where no one was giving much thought to that, then you end up with like our off the shelf Ubuntu where it's a little bit closer to a bell curve and the left tail of lower scores is a lot more noticeable. And you know, the um, n when we say hardened there, it's not like somebody spent days and days doing this. This is just like a, you know, minimal reasonable effort to make sure that you're doing a good quality build environment, like no code changes, 
just removing some things you might not need and rebuilding everything with all the uh, flags that will secure stuff without getting in the way of you using the system. Um, and then, so if you were going to say which of these you would like to see in an IoT environment, the like more hardened, organized uh, sort of view versus the off the shelf, everything is just up to whatever team wrote that bit of code. Uh, you, on IoT systems, you would like to think that vendors put some thought into hardening and organizing their security stance before they ship stuff out, but anyone who has looked at that knows that the scores you see on things like smart TVs or any other even fairly high-end IoT devices are, you know, much more liable to be closer to our off-the-shelf Linux than to the hardened uh, Linux environment. And, you know, the scores overall are lower than off-the-shelf Linux. Uh, so, you know, not shocking, but not promising either. And if you dig into what uh, safety features you see and what function hygiene looks like, you can see why that is. You know, that um, ideally you'd want to be comparing all these TV, smart TV environments to a hardened instance because that's what they should have done. But uh, since it's a more reasonable metric for now, we're comparing it to just off-the-shelf Linux. And you can see that while off-the-shelf Linux is pretty, um, that they're ahead of these other smart TVs in pretty much every application armoring category. Uh, Visio was the closest uh, to having a reasonable environment. Although the fact that uh, all of these are still 32-bit instead of 64-bit means they take a little bit of a hit there. And they're still slightly behind Linux in pretty much every category. Um, and then uh, Samsung was a little bit behind Visio, and then LG was just sort of a shit show. Uh, they were missing basically any application armoring at all. So that's just a little embarrassing. Because uh, if somebody shells out the sort of money you pay for a smart TV, you'd expect that at least the cost of one TV would have gone into hardening the environment on it. <laughs> so um, that's the sort of data we've been doing. Uh, and our organizational goals, as I mentioned before, number one is to remain independent of vendor influence, that we... Uh, uh, have some corporate partners, but we make sure they're not ones that we evaluate products from. And, uh, you know, that we in no way want to become the sort of organization where we're being paid by vendors to evaluate their products. It's just, I'm not saying that you can't uh, keep the public's interest in mind doing that, but it becomes a lot harder and it makes it a lot harder for other people to trust the data you're putting out. And uh, the goal is that we want to be evaluating software at a pretty large scale, so we want it to be automated. We want the data that comes out to be comparable so that instead of just saying, you all get gold stars, somebody can still tell who got the best gold star. Um, and that uh, the data is quantitative as possible, um, that, you know, that we're attaching numbers to things rather than this made me feel good. Um, and, you know, the goal is always to be looking out for the consumer first and foremost, to be a watchdog for them. Since a lot of software evaluation business models are much more about working for the vendors than the consumers. And uh, we are not finding specific vulnerabilities. We're not dropping O-days for the most part. If they are, they're pretty general. And uh, um, the things we're looking at really are things that vendors should be looking at themselves before products go out the door. So we don't disclose to them. It's their job to like update their build environment before they get something to ship. It's not our job to tell them how to do their job. And since we want to be evaluating all software at scale, that part won't at scale. You know, if it's a five-person shop, we just can't be hand-holding every security team out there on how to do a reasonable job of securing their products. So the three questions that we're trying to answer, the most basic is, of these different things that people think you should do in software, what actually works? You know, which things actually have an impact on exploitability and, you know, affect the overall security stance? Uh, which seems like one of those silly questions that we should already have the answer to, but 
we don't. We have a lot of proof of concepts that in specific cases, things prevented execution, or we know that it does increase security some amount, but no one's actually measured it. Nobody's done a large-scale study of a whole, like, you know, hundreds of binaries with and without some safety feature like ASLR or stack guards and actually measured what was the change in their fuzzing results or in, you know, whatever measure of security you want to use. And that's a major oversight as a field because without that sort of data that shows how effective a safety feature is, you can never expect somebody who isn't a security expert and didn't understand the paper explaining how this thing worked to buy into it because all it is is the same as every other product or solution they're being sold. The, I'm a security expert and this works, trust me. You know, and that argument isn't going to get you far because, you know, that it's just not reasonable to expect them to make large expenditures uh, for security based on their trust in you as an individual. That's uh, not how industries move. And uh, any other industry wouldn't be trying to do that. They, you know, in uh, any other sort of engineering discipline, somebody comes up with their bright idea solution, their proof of concept for why it works, and then there's a lot more science that goes into proving that it actually is worth the cost of outlaying it before it becomes widely adopted. And that's the part where the security industry has really dropped the ball. Uh, just to my general mini rant and call to action there to uh, um, don't forget the science just because it seems less exciting than moving on to the latest and greatest. Um, and so what things actually work? What impact do they actually have? How can you tell when they're there or not? And then who's doing it? That's what we want our uh, process to be answering. And as I mentioned, we are not looking for specific vulnerabilities because that's more data than we need in order to answer the basic question of how secure is something. The, like, what we want is what a consumer wants to know is, is this thing safe to use? And they don't care about if it has a buffer overflow on line whatever or, you know, that is more data than they need and it's more data than we need in order to help them out. And so, Given that we're looking for less data than an exploit writer would be looking for, that means we should have less work to do than they do. There should be ways of doing this that make our job easier, which is nice because it's rare that there's any sort of asymmetry that favors a defensive stance rather than an offensive one. Um, and we don't want to make ourselves be doing more work than we need to. So that's our main goal in this process, is to figure out how to answer just one without having to do more work than we need. So the first stage in that is static analysis. Um, static measurements like the ones you've seen, where we're looking at what safety features are present, what uh, functions are they using, complexity measures, and you know various other things that you can get from just looking at a binary. And uh, um, I've mentioned it in passing, but we are looking at binaries, not source code. Uh, partially because looking at source code means lots of NDAs and it gets in, it violates the goal of how we want to operate as an organization, but most importantly, because in a lot of ways, the source code is the building plan, but the binary is the building. It's the thing that the consumer actually gets and it's the thing that tells you, you know, what compile settings did they have and, you know, it's the reality. And uh, um, there's just too many things you can't learn from looking at source code. So um, static analysis is all the things that we know how to measure now. And the problem with that is that we don't have a strong way of turning that into a score right now because we don't have those measures of impact yet. So that means that um, we need another data set to compare it to. And it doesn't mean those measures are meaningless. Uh, when we've come up with like really basic scoring mechanisms based on this data, they line up pretty well with exploit prices for uh, those same products, which means that it's a reasonable measure of uh, how difficult something is to newly exploit. We just want to have it be uh, something that we can stand behind a little bit more than, eh, it seems reasonable. Um, so, we need a second data set to correlate stuff against, something that's an accepted measure of exploitability. So, that means 
lots and lots of fuzzing. Uh, and so that's where we're at now, is trying to build up as large a data set of fuzzing results as possible that we can correlate against our static analysis results. Um, and uh, because, you know, the more robust something is when it's fuzzed, the more, less likely it is to be exploitable. And this is a pretty industry accepted uh, measure of security these days, and something that's at least somewhat automatable. The filling in that somewhat, the test harness development is uh, our current main research focus. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't actually expect to be able to fuzz everything, but if we can fuzz enough stuff with enough variety and binaries, then we don't have to fuzz everything because of our friend Bayes. Uh, the static data that we've collected correlated against the fuzzing data will help us build a model, and then we can predict what the fuzzing results would have been for the things that just uh, our fuzzer can't handle. And, you know, this allows us to also predict the fuzzing results for things that are just probably not fuzzable as a whole, like uh, more basic IoT environments we can uh, get a measure of general security without having to figure out how to, like, fuzz, strip down IoT uh, stuff, which is not a research area we want to have to rat hole ourselves in. Um, but, yes, so looking at correlations and all the data science magic will help us figure out which of these static features that we think are important actually are, which ones strongly correlate with fuzzing results that we care about. Um, and then we can build up a nice robust model so that we don't have to do that expensive, uh, annoying uh, fuzzing unless we, you know, uh, unless it, it's easy, unless it's something that our harness uh, can fit and, you know, allow us to keep our model robust and uh, developing in the face of uh, changes to how security operates. And the indicators that we're looking at might not be causal. We don't care. The, we call them indicators because they are just indicators of overall security. That Some of them might be causal. It might be that having this feature directly prevents exploitation or having this function call directly introduces exploits. But it might also be that this is a feature of software that you see from uh, development teams that know what they're doing. Like uh, um, when people use things like the newer, safer versions of functions. It might be less that that's really actively preventing exploits, but more that only security conscious developers know to use those. And that that means the overall quality of their code is better. We don't know. That's one of our open questions that we're looking forward to answering when we get this large data set. And uh, we are also looking forward to having this data set so that we can share it with other academics and allow people other than us to start answering these questions because there's so many open questions about how these things correlate and we want to get more eyes than just us on it. We're really looking forward to uh, getting to the state where we can do that. And, uh, yeah, so we use the word indicator because we were inspired by indicator minerals. When people are looking for diamonds, they look for things like garnets, not because garnets turn into diamonds or garnets make diamonds, but because the same process that makes the garnets also makes diamonds. And that's why, you know, indicator uh, for software is, like, the, the term we've been using. And then after we have all our pretty data that we're happy with, the final stage is sharing it. So while we're working on that, we're also working with web development teams so they can make pretty browsable formats that, you know, people won't get scared off of if they're scared of security in general. Uh, and, you know, that if somebody isn't scared of security, they can click and dig deeper and find out where the numbers came from. Uh, you know, try to be as flexible as possible. And uh, we're building relationships with partner organizations so that we don't have to get in the business of publishing this stuff ourselves. We're looking forward to one day having our data be one of those little filled-in bubbles in a consumer reports review. And uh, um, 
we're looking for other partnerships of that nature to help our data reach various different subsets of uh, um, uh, software consumers. And then finally, uh, we're looking for organizations to do mutual data sharing with. Um, in particular, we're looking at how our static analysis mechanisms that were first developed for desktop software work in firmware environments and uh, building out our ability to deal with the myriad different chipsets and architectures that you find in IoT. And that means that we have to have a lot of firmware environments. Getting all of those ourselves, all those firmware images, is something we're capable of, but it sidetracks us from our main mission. So we're looking for people who have big libraries of firmware images that they would like to share in exchange for getting back analytics on what we found about those images. So if that's something of interest, then you can pass me a card later or let me know. So um, the static analysis is pretty much developed and we've got our nice uh, um, pipeline in place. And it's a very modular system so that if something new comes up that we think is of interest for static analysis, it's pretty easy to pop something in. We're going to show some early specter uh, data uh, relating to that because uh, when that came out, Pat said, oh, I think I know how I could look for a particular type of specter widget and, you know, in a couple weeks we had it implemented and enough data out that we were able to uh, fit that into the end of the talk. And then um, the other stuff is past the initial prototype stage, but we're working on making it, you know, better, stronger, or in the fuzzer's case, less picky about what it eats. That's why it's a goat. <laughs> um, and I covered this one mostly. So we can do desktop, uh, Windows, Linux, and OS X environments. So, uh, you know, PE, ELF, and Mako. And we can do some ARM and things like that, but we need a lot more pipe cleaners to send through our system before we can be confident that it's not going to, you know, eat itself on some new weird edge case for IoT. And uh, we have new data for operating systems and browsers. We've talked about this at talks before, um, but the last time we looked at all of these, uh, the um, results were pretty different. The um, OS's, the difference is less drastic. They're all doing pretty well on ASLR and DEP. Um, Windows was missing some stack guards. Uh, but had almost total CFI, which is a big change from when we had looked at this uh, a year ago. So they've been really rolling out their uh, CFI capabilities. And um, uh, Linux is still ahead of OS X in terms of source fortification. Uh, and then uh, in terms of function hygiene, as expected, Windows is still doing the best there because that does seem to be one of Microsoft's big priorities. Uh, when we look at browsers, this is where we see the biggest change from last year, because last year they were all over the map in terms of their application armoring, and now they're all doing pretty decently. Um, and you can see that reflected in the fact that the scores are all pretty close now. The um, 95th percentile score on Linux was 71, so they're all doing pretty well. And actually, where Firefox was not scoring well the last time we looked at this. Now they're pretty, they're the head of the pack. Um, part of that is that we haven't been able to quantify sandboxing well enough to put that into a score, so that might give Chrome more of an edge, but they're all decent choices these days. Opera did take a hit for missing RELRO, um, but uh, it's clear that these org open source organizations have noticed the lack of application armoring and made it more of a priority since the last time we called this out. Um, and uh, on OS X, very similar story. Uh, Firefox and Opera really upped their game here. Chrome is behind them now, not because they got worse, but because they uh, were sitting on their laurels a little and didn't do anything, whereas the other ones got a fire lit under their butts. Um, although they're still the only ones with the explicit heap ex uh, data execution prevention flag. Um, that's one of those things where most of the industry seems to be accepting that that is 
something that the operating system will handle. But if you have a flag that says whether something can handle heap data execution prevention or not, I, I don't see why you wouldn't say, yes, I can handle that. Um, and uh, all of them were, uh, again, very close scores, very close to the, uh, to the 95th percentile mark for the environment. Um, and that's really the big story here is that uh, they've all upped their game to the point where you could pick any of these based on, you know, your personal preferences uh, at the moment, uh, at least through this fairly specific lens of uh, application armoring and function hygiene. Um, and uh, in Windows, Edge still has the edge over the others, although they've mostly caught up. Chrome was uh, lacking some, uh, they had more 32-bit binaries than one might expect, and that was like the biggest surprise there. Uh, the other thing we've been able to do is get multiple images of an environment going back a bit so that we can see uh, what direction it's been moving. Uh, so uh, for OS X, we've got um, three previous versions of El Capitan, and then the fourth one is uh, the move to High Sierra. And uh, overall, the trends at the operating system level were positive. The biggest change was uh, them increasing the number of binaries that were 64-bit. But pretty much everything trended in the right direction, except for that heap flag, uh, which seems to just steadily decrease as other things increase. I'm not sure why, but the compiler settings uh, for OS X environments seem to be doing an either-or thing with that heap flag versus other uh, application armoring features. And um, uh, the other thing I noticed was just that High Sierra got a little smaller. It had fewer binaries, um, like a, a few hundred fewer, which is, uh, uh, indicates like a concerted push to cut down on some extra mass. And uh, when we look at Safari across those four environments, the story's a little bit less clear. The trends overall from 10.10.5 to 10.13.1 were positive, but some of them peaked earlier, and uh, we saw more binaries without uh, the right application armoring uh, features being introduced in the last two images. So that is the one negative story here is that they seem to be getting a little sloppier with some of the new things they're introducing. Um, although the one counter to that is that uh, High Sierra was the first one where we saw any source fortification in, uh, in Safari. And uh, now, uh, hey Pat, oh. you're up. Okay. <laughs> Uh, now Pat's going to talk about the uh, Spectre stuff that we were looking at. Yep. So uh, I'm Patrick. I write programs that generate programs that generate data about programs <laughs> that fill hard drives. So um, uh, when the Spectre and uh, uh, Meltdown vulnerabilities came out, uh, I thought it was the coolest thing I had seen in 20 years. So luckily I was afforded the time to experiment with uh, what all was going on here. And I sold my coworkers on uh, writing something using our engine to extract potentially useful specter widgets or gadgets out of uh, you know, system binaries. So for example, in the case of the uh, BTB or branch target buffer uh, that uh, poisoning uh, that has been labeled variant two, although if you read the actual original papers, they give like a much richer, more general description. So I think it's a bit of a false labeling, but it's good reference. Um, this has to do with indirect branches. Well, the interesting thing is, is that's the way all, well, all modern uh, uh, runtime linking works for shared libraries. So there's examples of indirect branches in everything, pretty much no matter what. Even if it's not like, you know, uh, a whole bunch of C++ with virtual, you know, functions or, you know, function pointer land like uh, the Linux kernel. There's tons of indirect branches that you can hijack. So, uh, what would a general pattern for this be, look like? It would be some operation that uses a base address or index of something that is either you control if you want to leak, or that like an attacker can control in an Oracle-like fashion, 
or that the program just naturally has uh, the address of useful memory there, right? Um, that loads it into a register, and we'll call this register one. Uh, then you can actually have like kind of anything go on as far as the gadget, as long as you're not hurting register one. You have to preserve register one. Um, so then you have an, uh, another operation where preferably base or the index used by that instruction does a load or a store in the, the U control or it's a useful address for the attack uh, for it to do that load or store. Hence, uh, that can be your probe, right, where you're probing in order to do this cache timing attack to disclose the value read in the first operation, right? So the, the, the long story short is, is we're looking for load and then a load or a store, right, where we have some knowledge or there's useful stuff in registers, right? Now, again, we, we don't, like, I, we've just been mining the data. We don't know at this point, like, if it's useful or not. This just made, like, kind of a pretty cool slide, and also it afforded me the ability to kind of slack on other obligations. <laughs> <coughs> So uh, I have two graphs, because actually a lot of them came out the same. So back to what I was saying about the dynamic linking on, on systems. So uh, all software follows like an application binary interface. So there's certain registers that have certain purposes. So it seems statistically likely that it would be important to consider the registers that the ABI uses to pass arguments, right? Because those are going to be the ones that are active there. We, we also did uh, reserved uh, uh, registers that, as far as what the ABI tells you that the call caller ha, or callee has to preserve. And they actually gave very similar shapes. So we made it, made the, 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 image, the graph on the left was sufficient to illustrate like all cases. They all kind of look like this. With the exception of uh, by register, there's a huge bias towards uh, EAX on x86. Um, still speculating about this uh, uh, on as to why. But we can see uh, on the three platforms, these are all 64-bit variants. We have Ubuntu in red, OS X in yellow, and Windows in blue. And there's a ton more of one uh, widgets that require one useful register that you control, right? Uh, there's two, two registers that drops off significantly, which just makes sense. It should be, you know, logarithmic. The likelihood of, like, you losing uh, control of that reg one or having multiple registers should drop off logarithmically. Again, this is, I, I haven't fully qualified this. This is just like a mental heuristic that seems obvious, but who knows? And then at, at the point of three registers, you're, you're kind of wandering into no man's land, right? And, and, and they're not as common. So like, uh, Windows has a lot of these widgets, right, compared to the other two. The other two are about the same, you know, but there's a huge bias. Next, the graph on the right is uh, widget count versus number of instructions. Because you're speculatively executing these, you have the time it takes the processor to figure out that the branch trace buffer, the address that it thought it was supposed to branch to and it was taking as an optimization, is not the address it should be at and revert the processor state. So you'll get a few instructions of execution, but for uh, sake of argument, I mined out really, really big ones, and I, I truncated it at 16 because you can't even see the, the values there. So that's number of instructions per widget. And this makes sense that it would drop off logarithmically as well because uh, uh, trying to find the complex pattern while preserving register contents, uh, uh, it, it becomes increasingly difficult the more elements you add. Um, further, smaller widgets are more useful in the case of this attack because of the race that I mentioned against the, okay, uh, 10 minutes. So uh, we can see also, once again, a bias towards Windows. Um, that's uh, the, the best I can figure, and my current hypothesis as to why this is, is that uh, Visual Studio or Visual C, from what I've seen, has an 
has a uh, a not as good poor poorer poorer uh, load store optimizer than GCC or Clang. Uh, that's my only hypothesis. But also this afforded me the time to do a little bit more experimenting and realize that portions of the papers that were published are not complete. This is not on the slides. I'm, I, I, was, I was given the authorization to freewheel this a little bit. So uh, uh, the, the whole, the meltdown attack was that Intel CPUs will speculatively execute uh, and fetch kernel memory and that the exception whenever it looks up the uh, supervisor flag page from user space will not uh, not be propagated as fast as it will speculatively execute to a point where you've interacted with the cache and can leak the backend register contents, which is not revertible. It also ignores the non-executable flag. This is something that they missed. I, I've shared this with a few people, and I really want to see if somebody comes up with something interesting. So beyond just being able to read kernel memory on Intel CPUs, you can also create your own widgets in the data segment, and it doesn't matter if it's non-executable or not. Uh, you can speculatively execute out of it. Um, so that's, that's my blurb, and uh, thank you. Right. So, uh, in general, when we uh, beat companies up over things like ASLR and stack guards and stuff like that, people assume that means that's all we're measuring. It's just the only thing that's worth beating them up over right now because, you know, if somebody left their front door open, you don't need to bug them about whether they have shatter sensors on their windows. Now that the browsers have all gotten to something of the same page in terms of those basics, we can start turning the screws and start bringing in some of these more sophisticated sophisticated things we're working on measuring. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, saying, okay, great, now let's do the real stuff. Um, uh, and yeah, the, so that's the um, whole thing where, uh, yeah. Um, and so in terms of impact, we're very excited that the open source browsers have uh, upped their game in terms of these security basics like application armoring. Um, and uh, I don't know if it's causal or not, but it, Firefox and Opera have both improved in that respect since we started shedding light on this. So, yay. Um, and uh, in a more causal thing, we have been sub uh, submitting patches and bugs to the packages we've been using, like LLVM and QMU. Um, and the thing we're most excited about is the Fedora Red Team uh, starting up their own ITL to uh, do this sort of evaluation on their own products to make sure that they are th sending things out the door that are worth, uh, you know, that have all the, these basic security features in place and that they are happy giving to a consumer to use. We're looking forward to the day when that's standard procedure everywhere, but they're the first ones to jump on that particular bandwagon and we're very excited about it. Um, and uh, we are working with Consumer Reports on figuring out how to in integrate our sorts of data into their product reviews when those products involve software. And on the digital standard, which uh, is um, linked on the back end at uh, GitHub. So if you look at it and you're like, that's a stupid question to ask, or I would have asked that differently, you can submit edits to it and be a part of that process of figuring out how to evaluate um, the uh, you know, digital products for um, security and privacy and governance and all sorts of other jazz that are frequently out of our personal purview. And uh, so we have our proof of concepts for static analysis in place. Now we're working at building scale and building up this other data set to correlate against. Um, but uh, as we go, if we figure out exciting things, we'll continue to share them, uh, just like we have done at previous talks and are doing now. And, uh, you know, if you're a security ve software vendor, it's just uh, make sure that you have all these exploit mitigation techniques in place. Uh, our technical advisory board of exploit writers was very thorough in coming up with their list of what they look for when they're trying to find soft targets to start with. And uh, so, you know, you should be building up a similar list of checklists to do when your product is ready to go out the door. Or before that, which might be nice too. <laughs> um, so, uh, you can find our conference landing page here with a download for the slides and uh, um, 
yeah, looking forward to sharing new findings with everyone in the future. Um, and I think we're pretty close on time, but we might have time for a couple questions. Five minutes, okay. Uh, yeah? Right. We have not yet, but we're not totally opposed to it either because they don't fall in the category of people whose software we're evaluating. And because we would like to have some influence on the um, uh, cyber insurance industry to uh, see if we can get that to be uh, an influencer to make companies care more about the security stance. Um, uh, so that's something we're open to. We don't have any partners yet, but, uh, uh, you know, the if it's not something that's going to get in the way of the mission, we're happy to consider it. Uh, in the back? Uh, a lot of exploit mitigation techniques are more effective in 64-bit environments than 32-bit. Um, it's just the, the security there is more sophisticated, and that's the way things in general are moving. And, uh, so 32-bit environments are also getting updated less and uh, getting less of the latest and greatest security features. Uh, yeah, um, you? In the, uh, the back of the two. Yeah, you were... Um, I think that uh, you can use it as one of your sticks or carrots to how you view it uh, when you're trying to argue for, if you're in a development role, arguing for some unit tests or things like that to ensure that all the safety features you think you have are actually there, or uh, for you know safety features like checking what functions people use in development and things like that, that um, using the fact that we will start publicly shaming as a reason for pushing for those sorts of basic uh, production hygiene practices. I think that would be a good place to start, um, trying to get organizations to uh, think about this stuff in a more organized fashion. Um, uh, and on the digital standard, uh, the, there are points on that where we have questions that we think are important to ask about products, but that we don't know how to answer at a scale yet. And so if any of those give you research ideas for uh, things where you think you could fill in gaps, you can contact Consumer Reports and see if that's uh, an avenue they'd be happy to follow with you. Um, more than that, I think we're not quite ready for yet, but we appreciate the enthusiasm. <laughs> but um, we do, yeah, if you're at a larger organization and want to start standing up your own internal ITL style evaluations for products, we heartily encourage that. Uh, Mudge? <laughs> Um, right, so we have a lot of complexity measures, like uh, how many branch decisions are being made and uh, measures of function size and other things that people know make code harder to read. Uh, and then um, we've got more where right, at first we're just saying whether you have stack guards or not. We are looking at how many stack adjusts happen, so we can start looking at whether you have sufficient stack guards for the number of stack adjusts happening in your code. Um, and things like fortification uh, are, um, a, a lot of times somebody sets that flag and then they think they're done, but a lot of stuff 
didn't actually get fortified. So looking at uh, how much actually got fortified out of uh, the potentially fortifiable functions and things like that are uh, to start. Um, yeah, you? Right, okay, so you're the last question. Sorry, I just got my stop sign. Uh, so it'll be more of an emphasis on those complexity measures um, and, uh, you know, on the uh, lower level things we're doing, like the, um, uh, the uh, patterns, uh, code patterns that we're seeing that map to patterns we see in a, um, a more sophisticated desktop style environments and things like that. But, uh, yeah, so just the, the lower level stuff that we haven't been publicizing as much right now because it's, um, you know, harder to fix than just turning on a flag at compile time. Uh, so I, I think we're done. And uh, thank you very much. You've been great. Thank you.